Welcome to Popcast Deluxe, your emoji memoir of weekly cultural review. I am John Caramonica, critic of the New York Times. My name is Joe Coscarelli. I'm a reporter at the New York Times. We have a bit of a uh, jolting uh, ping pong of culture this week that we're going to be covering. Although, do they tell the same story about America? Maybe. Wow. Yeah, we're going to go there. We're going we're gonna to galaxy brain this. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the Britney Spears memoir, which is out now. The Woman and Me by Britney Spears. Quote marks. Uh, it has Britney Spears' name. On the cover. It is on the cover. Yeah. That's a photo. Right? Uh, this is a the first book. This is the Britney Spears book. We're going to start with that. Then we are going to pivot and talk about Killers of the Flower Moon, which is the new Martin Scorsese film based on the David Grand book about the murders of the Osage people in the 1920s during the era where oil was struck on their land and life got upended. So we're going to talk about Scorsese, Scorsese at 80 years old or 81 years old, uh, and uh, the deconstruction of the American experiment and the dirty, cruel evil that lies underneath it. Oh, so now, okay, now it's the Britney Spears story. That's why they're the same. Yeah. Uh, And then, of course, we have songs, and then, of course, we have snacks. Um... Start with Brittany. Uh, Joe, you have a particular special connection predating this. You have a special connection to the Brittany story. Yeah. And I don't very simply mean the photo of you backstage at the Vegas review, uh, you and her side by side. I don't mean that. Yeah. But talk a little bit about the backstory that gets us to this memoir. Yeah. So I've been covering the Britney Spears conservatorship uh, and then the end of the Britney Spears conservatorship since... 2015 yep were we ever so young nearly a decade uh spent thinking about britney spears and the mechanisms that controlled her career yeah uh for a large chunk of it since 2008 uh 13 years of conservatorship brought us up to 2021 we talked a lot about this on podcast in the past yes you want the story of me Retaking the photo of Britney Spears backstage. Yes. Go dig through the archives. There's there's plenty of Britney coverage uh, yeah. on podcasts. Uh, and then it was over during the pandemic. Quite suddenly. Quite suddenly. Uh, and in dramatic fashion, mm-hmm. you had her in the courtroom speaking publicly. Well, called. She phoned she, in. She called in. Uh, yes. In, in the summer of 2021. Talked about all she had experienced under the rule of her father uh, and her business team um, and was fairly promptly after that uh, freed. The mm-hmm. conservatorship was um, dissolved. Yeah, There continues to be a little bit of back and forth in court about who pays for what, uh, but for all intents and purposes, Britney Spears now in control of her life and career uh, for the first time in more than a decade. And one of the first things that came out of post-conservatorship was the idea that Britney was going to write a memoir. Yes. And here we are. And uh, this is out. uh, When this show comes out, this will be yesterday, but obviously you acquired a copy. Yes. We we here at the New York Times got our hands on an early edition, not through any deals with Britney or her team or the publisher, uh, but through good old-fashioned shoe leather legwork. Yes. Uh, We found an early copy. This happens with big books. Often, mm-hmm. uh, it's a little bit of a, a game between mm-hmm. news organizations. Um, and I think we got basically the first copy. I think there had been like a leak, to a fan taking pictures of one like in Mexico maybe. Um, but we, we, we got it. We read it very quickly that night, right. last week. Um, did some top line takeaways from the book. And here we are. So there have been some headlines and and stories that have been parceled out officially yes. from the book. Yes. Uh the main one being that when Britney was involved with Justin Timberlake, uh she got pregnant, he encouraged her to have an abortion. There's this additional detail that after after the procedure, she was in a tremendous amount of pain, he then arrives, sits on the floor with her, plays guitar. This happens relatively early in the book. And I, as I was reading the book, I'm thinking this is quite a vivid level of detail and a vivid level of recollection. And I wonder how much of this is going to last throughout the book. I, th- I, I think it's safe to say 
there is not a lot of that vivid level of detail and recollection in the remainder of the book. There is a reason that that was the leading excerpt from the book, yeah. especially in light of the fact that it seems as if Britney Spears is not going to promote this memoir in as a traditional yet. way. Yeah. She's not given any interviews. She's uh, posted somewhat enigmatically on Instagram, which has been a recurring theme. And and also recently, somewhat troublingly, on Instagram, dancing with knives and or what things that appear to be knives. Some bandages on the arms. Yeah. Fans calling the cops on her, checking for her wellness, her pushing back against that. Uh, she deactivated her Instagram over the weekend, reactivated it, wrote a notes app thing about the sort of trauma of the headlines around the book. Um, seems to be a complicated roll out and a complicated time and a complicated person's complicated life. I mean, when the conservatorship was dissolved, I think I, other fans, other observers had a hope that we would come to know the depths of things that had been happening for the past 10 years out of the public eye. And I think you've seen two threads of this, right? Like you see what's happening on Instagram and, and actually it's somewhat concerning. You, you see these uh, posts that don't have totally clear meaning and makes you wonder, okay, um, is, she being, is she well? Is she being looked after, et cetera? Then you have the book, which is ostensibly supposed to be revealing. And actually I found it quite the opposite. Uh, it's sort of... Um, um, kind of like skipped, like stone skipped over a lot of well-known and relatively well-documented public events and offers not that much additional context, not that much additional detail, maybe a little bit of feeling or reaction. But I would not say for someone who hasn't had a public voice in a, in a substantive way for this long, I wouldn't say it radically rewrites the story of the last 10 to 15 years. It's true. It's more of a brief commentary on an existing timeline yeah. than it is an upending of the Britney Spears story. Yeah. Like, were there any, was there anything in here you found genuinely surprising or like on a plot level, like on a this happened, then this happened, then this happened? Like, was there anything you didn't know? I don't know that there were any arcs, mini arcs, that were not known, not just to me, but just in general. I was struck with the kind of warmth with which she wrote about her late period boyfriends uh, and eventual husband, and now I think no longer husband. Yeah, he's since filed for divorce, but that is not included in the memoir. Um, uh, not because those relationships were not necessarily portrayed warm, but, but this is during an era of Britney where the fundamental public mood around her was one of mistrust bleeding into concern or maybe vice versa. And so um, those relationships felt uh, second, there were corollaries to the larger narrative. It's interesting to hear even briefly her talk about those relationships uh, and how she was seeking a kind of island in the storm, basically, in each of those cases. Um, but as far as news or detail, there's not a lot in here that's not publicly known. And if anything, it feels like a well-established um, TikTok of news events with an overlay of, I was there, I lived the event, and it made me feel A. Right. You get all of the major points. You get the first music video for Baby One More Time. Oh, well, well she said, uh, when, maybe she said in the past, but that she, it was her choice to do the school, school, do the school outfit. Yeah, they had a the treatment setup. that she didn't like. Right. She was like, actually, it should just be me and my friends in school. feel like some version of that story has been told Probably. a handful of times. But yeah, you get that. You get, you know, the super rise to fame. You get the Justin Timberlake relationship. You get her relationship with the other boy bands and Christina Aguilera yeah, sure. and whatever. Uh, but all a dusting. Yes, and it is brief. Dusting. This is a very quick, quick read. I mean, I genuinely read this book in certainly under 90 minutes. Yes, it is. Um, it's almost like the Drake poetry book <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of word count. Uh, these are very short sentences, very short chapters. Yeah. Uh, you move through time a lot. 
you know, you get the, the head shaving, the, paparia- the paparazzi era, you know, Paris Hilton, but Lindsay Lohan. Quickly, very quickly. Like, and again, look, having lived through the tabloid era and remembering the intensity every week, a new issue, every week, a new drama, a new tension, a new conflict, a new set of photos, a new set of tabloid articles. If you were to read this book and not have experienced that, it would almost sound calm sure. in retrospect. And I but do think I that's rem- part of the point she's making is like it wasn't that crazy. But what? then you get the, the push and pull where she's like, but also it was traumatizing the way I was treated by the media, et cetera. And I do think if you are going to write, and I don't want to call this a score settling book necessarily. It's definitely not that. Uh, and maybe like slightly it's in It's not like the to, Jessica Simpson book. No, and maybe slightly in, regar- in regards to her father. Maybe slightly. Oh, sure. But I wouldn't call this a score settling book. But like if you are going to write a memoir after years of silence during a tumultuous period to choose not to engage with the depth of the tumult, even if you're to say at a high level, I understand that the public viewed it this way, but it wasn't. But to engage with that really thoroughly, that uh, that's what I was expecting. And obviously you can't judge a book or any work of art by what it's not. But I think when you think of what the role of a book like this could mean for Britney Spears at this particular moment in her arc, that might be a real asset. And this feels a little bit like a punt. It feels perfunctory in some way. Is it just, I mean, is it just, does it exist simply to sell? I think that in some while ways. While withholding some of the, the most intense stuff. There is a lot of ambivalence toward the end, especially about her music and her music career. And yeah. if she ever will return to being a performer. And I do get the sense from many years of observing and listening to what Britney says. And you can see this in some of the Instagram posts. Like. I don't know that she wants to be a working famous person. It doesn't, it certainly doesn't seem that way. And that goes for the making of this book. I mean, you know, it, it's reported that she worked with a ghostwriter. That's on page six. You can find that person's name Mm -hmm. in the book itself. In the acknowledgements, it says like, shout out to my collaborators. You know who you are. Does that include Joe Coscarelli? uh, (laughs) And all of the the New York Times reporting that they borrowed from. Yes. Um, There are only a few moments where even the voice of Britney Spears comes through. Like, I do think we know enough from the speech she gave to court, to the judge, uh, the Instagram posts, the Instagram videos, past Britney Spears interviews, like, you know, roughly, if you're engaged in the subject matter, the way that her brain works, which is nonlinear, uh, playful, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, quite naive in some ways, Mm -hmm. but also jaded in others. Yeah. Um, And I just didn't really feel that coming off the page very often. Yeah, I I felt like there's a lot of hemming and hawing and also self-correction there are a lot of moments and i I felt this throughout the book but especially in the chapters and and keep in mind these are very short chapters like sometimes like two three pages and and even within the chapter sometimes it's like three or four sections that aren't totally like contiguous but when we're in the vegas section and it's on the one hand it's I'm relieved I can be with my kids on a regular schedule. And on the other hand, I hated that I couldn't change my show. But also I thrilled to performing. But also I was not performing the way that I wanted to perform. There was In a part lot- on purpose. She was saying yes, basically some, she right, held back. Right. It's like some combination of circumstance and then choice. There was a lot of I felt this way, but I also felt the opposite. And I'm not like people have complex feelings. Like yeah. obviously, like that's not that's not a problem. It's more that these are incredibly intense hence events, private events, that also had huge public consequence. And to say simply, I liked it, but I also disliked it. I, I felt comfortable, but also uncomfortable. There, As a reader, like, like reading it as text, it doesn't tell me a lot. I want to know more, and I'm firmly convinced there is more to tell. It's also just not super well written, unfortunately. Like. Yeah everything is it doesn't sound like her and it's yeah. yes it's like like for instance when justin and christina pose together on rolling stone yes. it's like salt in the wound yes. you know it's like mm-hmm. everything is the most predictable Phrasing. clean yes cliched version of what it could possibly be with like 
very few exceptions and it did make those moments leap off the page a little bit like the part where she's making fun of in sync for trying to be blacker than oh yeah than everybody else yeah, like yeah, can course. i should i read a little bit from from that I, section i mean i wish you wouldn't but <laughs> but yes um, this is just like to me this was one of the one of the things that a landed. genuinely funny story yeah yeah uh <laughs> she's talking about justin and how they're like magnets uh when they're falling in love which again you know his band in sync was what people back then called quote so pimp <laughs> they were white boys but actually, they loved hip-hop i feel like i should have googled like so in sync so pimp just <laughs> to, to see if anyone they called them so, so pimp. pimp uh to me that's what separated them from the backstreet boys who seemed very consciously to position themselves as a white group in sync hung out with black artists sometimes i thought they tried too hard to fit in like i believe this is coming from Britney's memory. Mm -hmm. uh, one day, Jay and I were in New York going to parts of town I'd never been before. Walking our way was a guy with a huge blinged out medallion. He was flanked by two giant security guards. Jay got all excited and said so loud. All right, here's the part where you got to forgive me. Oh, yeah. Faux shiz, faux shiz. Genuine. What's up, homie? <laughs> After Genuine walked away, Felicia, who was Britney's assistant at the time, did an impression of Jay. Oh, yeah, for shiz, for shiz, Genuine. <laughs> Jay wasn't even embarrassed. He just took it and looked at her like, okay, F you, fee. <laughs> okay, first of all, if within 24 hours TMZ has not found Genuine to ask him to for his memory of this. on that story, yep. and Genuine, we want the real answer. Yep. Uh, just for the record, I Googled and <laughs> sync so pimp. Uh, we're, we're landing on a Rolling Stone profile of Justin Timberlake. I think it might have been a cover story, 2003. A few months ago, after a, this is an Eric Hedegaard story, a few months ago, after attending the Mike Tyson Lennox Lewis dust up in Memphis and buying himself a new $115,000 V12 493 horsepower Mercedes S600, <laughs> parentheses, it's pimp. So pimp. That's quoting Tim, Justin. Quoting Justin. Timberlake checked okay. into da 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 da. Okay, so, so maybe maybe this was researched. <laughs> this this anecdote. So um, pimp. But like that. You're that's... so pimp of weekly culture. <laughs> <laughs> like you could you could do that for 500 pages. Yeah. Just like tell me funny stories about being around celebrities yeah. at an insane moment in popular culture. Uh, uh, also, I will say to that point, the Madonna anecdote. Actually, that was it. She that loves was, Madonna. And I will say, uh, one of the moments in this that really made me sit up straight was where they're doing the video together and Madonna has a like a wardrobe issue, like something like stitching is not right. And Madonna says, nobody's doing anything until this is right. And Britney's original read is, literally, it's my song. Like, what, like yeah. uh, why am I waiting for you to... And then slowly she kind of came to realize, maybe falsely a little bit, but came to realize, like... Madonna doesn't do anything until Madonna does. And the fact that Madonna is the center and the pacer of everything and Britney realizing that she needs to take a right. little bit of that. That's for power. Herself. Yes. Yeah. That I found credible and moving. Like that was like a real, I'm sure after years and years and years under the conservatorship and also just of general being the pop star who gets moved place to place and says, you have to sing here now, sing there now to see someone truly in control of their circle that way must have been eye-opening and i do wish there was a little bit more about this idea of she has never been in control yeah, yeah, of anything more. like that way was more. the that was she the tension one form of lack of control for another form of lack of control both of which were imposed upon her yes uh other highlights from this like anything that hit for you i mean like all of it has been so chewed up already in the week before the book came out. It's like the Colin Farrell bit. Like, sure, we remember vaguely if you looked at tabloid mm -hmm. photos from the early 2000s that they had a fling. Yeah. Uh, and it seemed fun. And like the two sentences where she describes it as like a street brawl. Like, that's pretty good. Vivid, great. But like, I would have done for a whole chapter. Like, what did you and Colin Farrell do together? Like, what? Totally like, agree. other than street brawl. Uh, I mean, the thing is, this book seems designed to it's a checkbox book did i mention a did i mention b did i mention c did i mention d and does that mean that the actual stories were too hard to access that they were too painful does it mean that she didn't give a lot of time to the co-writer and the co-writer just sort of working with like 
a mix of publicly available information and top a, line story top telling. line storytelling and like a few anecdotes that you do manage to extract within your i mean you know this is this is an interview job. I mean, I mean this in an affectionate yeah, way. Yeah, co-writing like, a book with a celebrity. Because an in- you're yes. interviewing the celebrity, trying to extract a lot from them. It's not that different from what you and I do on a daily basis. You get what the person gives. I always tell interview subject, you, you get out of this what you want, what you give to it. Did this person, was Brittany giving enough to make this book more than what it is? I don't know. That's tough to say. But I, I, were there things that stuck with me? It's interesting to see her kind of like go back and forth on Jamie Lynn, I yeah. thought. Like her, her relationship to her mom and her sister is fascinating and yeah. very unsettled, even within her, obviously. Yeah. Um, and that ambivalence comes across mm-hmm. on the page. I mean, the anger she has really hit me where she says one of her physical manifestations of the anger that she carries around from the conservatorship is that now she's getting migraines. Oh, yeah, towards the end, yeah. And not only is she getting migraines, but she's too scared of doctors to go have them treated. Mm-hmm. Like, that, to me, like, that's, like, that's a gut punch. Yeah. Um, and that might have been, been the only one in the whole book for me, you know, of, like, a true from the depths. You know, and it's, like... And the problem is, I'm not saying that she owes us anything, but then she didn't need to like no this like is, she didn't need to write this memoir now. But then let's it's too fresh. If but it's then, too fresh, it's too fresh. But let's let's have a, a more generous, optimistic read. This memoir is a bridge to something. Sure, it's a first tentative step of freedom after a decade plus of manipulation. Based on what we're seeing in the world, a bridge to what? But this is what I was saying about this idea that I just don't feel like she wants to be a professional famous person. And I wish she could fully let go and that we as a culture could fully let go of needing to extract more from her. Like if Britney wants to live in isolation and make dance videos, I know those two things don't necessarily go together because every time she makes a video, it's as if she put out a memoir. Yeah, It goes viral. Yeah. But like. If she could just not be a professional, if she could just not be Britney Spears, Inc., I think that would be better for everyone. Because, like, this does not tell me that she wants to bridge it to another phase in her career. It tells me, like, she still just wants to be left alone. Yeah, I don't know if I could say it better or if we should say more. Um, Should we pivot to... Another dark chapter <laughs> yeah, in American Jeez. history. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon is the new Scorsese film. The Osage. They have the worst land possible. But they outsmarted everybody. The land had oil on it. Black gold. Money flows freely here now. I do love that money, sir. <laughs> <laughs> takes place in uh in the early 1920s uh late 1910s and early 1920s sort of in the the post-world war one period where oil is found on the land of the osage indians and a number of white men uh try to find a way to capitalize on it through uh marrying through shady business deals and through murder seemingly uh this is a a story that was told in a recent uh, a david grand book from a few years ago and uh, that book also ca- documents the birth of the FBI. This is uh, J. Edgar Hoover is the founder of the Bureau of Investigation or the head of the Bureau of Investigation that sends folks down and then solves, sort of solves the case, I guess. Uh, first of all, as all caveats with uh, Bob Gass Luxon films, I don't see a lot of movies. Although I am enjoying, <laughs> I am enjoying. You're enjoying going to, being forced enjoying, to go to the movies? Yeah, I am. All right. I, I liked, okay, so I saw this last night. I saw it. In a largely empty, by choice, there were a few theaters near me showing it. I chose to go to the emptiest one. I liked the sense that I could just sit in the back row, like no one's going to You're being converted to the magic of cinema? Unbelievable. (laughs) Scorsese did it again. (laughs) At that thing at the beginning of the movie, did you have that? Yeah, where he speaks. Thank you for coming to watch this movie on the big screen. Apple paid two hundred million dollars to make this movie, and he's like, "Don't you dare stream this." Uh, I will also note: watching Flower Moon took 
way longer than reading the Britney Spears book. <laughs> uh, watching Flower Moon took longer than the Eras Tour. <laughs> it's true. The Eras Tour. The actual Eras Tour, not the movie. Not the movie edit. The actual Eras Tour. Uh, so the <laughs> that is like my number one thing when I saw how long it was. Immediately, I said. Eras. It's longer than the Aerosaur. Longer than the Aerosaur. The yeah. first thing I thought. Yeah. So the Aerosaur film, the Aerosaur film is like two hours and forty eight minutes. The Aerosaur in actuality was like three fifteen, three twenty, and yeah. this was like three twenty six, which is like very long. I will say it is not as thrilling traditionally as a Scorsese movie. No. Like even in editing, like there's not a lot of fun montages. No. You get a couple uh, sort of scattered throughout, but it is very deliberately paced, and yet. As the god Richard Brody said, maybe the fastest three hours in the movies, like of my life. I did not think that it dragged. Like I, I was like, I'm all in on auteurs going over three hours. Marvel, no reason for you to go over three hours. That's just fan service. That's a that's a streaming album with 28 tracks. But if you're Marty, if you're PTA, if you're Quentin Tarantino, if you're the only people left making real cinema no go as long as you want because i do feel like like and you get this every time he makes a movie it's like this might be the last time i ever make a movie look i and get film that. as a I as a medium is dead our for look our my friend our friend zach's gq story where you have uh marty like reckoning with uh mortality death. yeah and just like basically i don't pass time i spend time that's not, like honestly, that should be a hustle. That's like a hustle, a hustle meme. Yeah. A hustle meme. <laughs> yeah. Some past time, spend time. Um, like, I, the first two hours could have been twenty to forty minutes shorter. Like it, to me, the film really picks up when the investigation starts. Well, this is like, interesting because we should talk about the sorry and, the, and the forgive, way the and plot works. And also, in advance, forgive me if you have not seen this film. There may be some things that come up in this conversation, and I'm going to try to push them. We'll, we'll the do it. All right, we'll do like five, ten more minutes, and then we'll do a hard spoiler Fine. alert so we can talk you about the ending. You say the things that aren't going to get us in trouble, and then I'll <laughs> say the things that will get us. In okay, trouble. fine. Uh, <laughs> first thing, you didn't see the Irishman in the theater, did you? No. Did you see the Irishman at all? No. All right, you're going to go home and you're going to watch the Irishman in like eight sittings, uh, <laughs> but but it's okay. In between the Golden Bachelor episodes, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Okay, the length aside, the choice that was made in making this movie is to center the Osage people and their yes. experience, and particularly the marriage between Ernest uh, Burkhart, Leonardo DiCaprio's character. <laughs> you're gonna do the oh, you're, yeah. you're gonna do Leo oh, face yeah, we're the doing rest it of the all pod day long. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the posture, like the neck out. Yeah, yeah. His marriage to uh, Molly. Molly Burkhart. Yes. Uh, his wife and who is full blood Osage yes played by Lily Gladstone yep. um, in you know what is I think considered to be the uh, runaway performance of the movie we could talk about whether it worked for you or not yeah sure um, but the book is written as a crime procedural and it's told through uh, the Jesse Plemons character mm -hmm. the, the Bureau of Investigation uh, agent who comes to town and it's Basically a whodunit, even though it's not that mysterious whodunit. What Scorsese... And it's also a much more involved story. Like, in reading some of the backstory, there's a number of aspects of the investigation that are kind of uh, either squeezed out of the story altogether or, like, winnowed down into one character. Or sure, so which is typical in a, yeah, abridgment uh, yes. for, for a script. Uh, it's like but, the IG stories versus the YouTube show. Yes, you wanna, exactly. You watch the YouTube show. Uh, but uh, what they decided to do far along in the process after they had a 200 page script was totally take the story and turn it inside yeah. out and focus on the relationship to better center the people of the Osage Nation. Yes. Uh, and that I thought was a crazy choice uh, It for especially for a Scorsese movie because would even and and then his treatment of the bad guys. You're basically following the bad guys for three and a half hours. They so they tell you what they do and you see how it affects the victims. Yes. And it is very literal. It is very it's 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 not a mystery. It's not fun in the way that his stories of quote unquote villains usually 
are. And I think that was intentional. Because the stakes, the stakes are so high. Yeah. And so evident and so high. Yeah. yeah. And there's no, like, there's no tricking you into identifying with who are ultimately the villains. And I don't know if that worked for me as much as his movies usually do. Um, but I'm curious w- what you thought of that storytelling choice. And then we can talk a little bit more about the specifics. Yeah. I mean, I think there's this... When you see DiCaprio on screen, it's hard to see. I'm, not that DiCaprio doesn't play complicated or even negative characters, but it's hard to see him as something, even in his failures, there's a, there's a heroism. And it's like he's, even in this film, like the constant playing against like the prettiness of DiCaprio, yeah. the sort of like the stubble and like the clothes are like, the, you know, like a little rumble, well, and he's playing a very passive character. He's playing a dumb guy, a really dumb guy. Yes, and a pawn, very much a pawn. And then you know, De Niro. In a weird way, I would like to see less of DiCaprio and more of De- because De Niro. I felt filled the screen. I mean, an incredible yeah, performance. Like, like genuinely filled yeah. the screen, but was somehow minimized. Like I always felt like he was in shadow a tiny bit. But like, and I don't know if that's my imagining or an actual choice, but. Um, DiCaprio wasn't given quite enough to work with to feel complicated. I mean, I think Pawn is right. He or even like a um, a pinball, like he's moving back and forth, and he has the actual most challenging emotional thing happening, which is on the one hand. I'm sorry. Now we're gonna go into spoiler territory. On the one hand, oh, sorry. <laughs> Just to note, we are pausing recording for a moment paused. so our producer, Sawyer Roque, can leave the room so as not to have Flower Moon spoiled for her before she sees it tonight. Anyway. Sawyer's out of the room. <laughs> You're still here, though. So you have to, if you don't want to know, this would be a great time to skip ahead to, to the songs and the snacks. And if you want to see the movie without having it spoiled, come back and listen after yes. you see the film. This will still be here. Yes. Um. So DiCaprio's character has genuinely, I feel like, the only true emotional push and pull in the film, which is on the one hand, he loves his wife, and on the other hand, he's literally killing his wife. And he loves money, as he says yes. quite hilariously yeah. in one of the best lines of the film. Um, and so, you know, you look at De Niro, and De Niro's like, I'm sorry, I'm going to use actor names. Uh, I'm a great friend to the Osage people. King. King. King's his nickname. <laughs> King uh, I'm a great friend to the Osage people. They're great friends to me, but also he has some of them killed uh, for the insurance money. Um, his kind of um, uh, two-facedness, like his cl- his tension is clear. DiCaprio really actually is in a position where a lot more emotional nuance would serve the character better. And I, I sort of found myself constantly being like, I don't feel like you're actually committed to either of these things. You don't seem terribly committed to killing your wife for evil, and you don't seem terribly committed to loving your wife. Even though I think the affection between him and Molly, the ca- his is wife, is, is that feels real. But I think his ambivalence is intentional, and I think it is explained through his simplicity. Uh, I think you know when you think of him. When you think of him administering the drugs yeah, sure. later in the film and then eventually having to try what he knows deep down is harming her, but he has to try it himself to sort of say, like, what am I doing here? And I actually think afterthought, mm, but I actually think the true the character you're getting that complication from is the Molly character, because I think on one hand, she knows pretty well who is killing her people Mm -hmm. and not only her people but her immediate family Mm -hmm. and then herself and she knows that her husband is somehow complicit in it if not actively perpetrating Mm -hmm. and yet she has this love for him and I feel like the you're actually watching her process it and try to figure it out more than you're trying to trying to figure out what his motivations are. Do you feel like her the character's expression of growing love for Ernest really come through on the screen? Because I feel like you see some of the playfulness, but the thing that I think uh, Lily Gladstone, the actress, does so well is holds the screen mm-hmm. with... A poker face. And and with um, kind of um, a regal grace and a seriousness of presence, but 
anytime the film kind of asks something a little bit different, it, it feels like it starts to fall apart. Every time she's standing in the middle, like, and I feel like the she's centered in a lot of shots. Yes. Like, quite literally, she's centered. Yep. You're meant to understand this is the paragon of moral value. This is the paragon of virtue. This is the person on whom your sentiment about the film hinges. Mm -hmm. When she's standing there like that, everything feels right. The minute it starts to move away from that and and she the playfulness never feels like it's over. I mean, again, this is a long film. Yeah. And I know you want to have your get his auteur off, and that's fine. <laughs> but I'm also saying, like, if you have all this room for exposition, you don't want a scene earlier in the film that shows the depth of affection that they're developing for each other. Like also I thought it was quite it was quite simple and primal. I mean, you get this their sort of first date scene where she makes him dinner, they listen to the storm, mm -hmm. they drink a little whiskey. She's just hot for the guy. Like the 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 bit where she's on the blanket with her sisters and they're mm -hmm. looking at all the white guys and yeah, they're yeah. just objectifying them. Mm -hmm. Um and I you know, she calls him like little coyote. Mm -hmm. Like she's just like uh, there's a oh oh the <laughs> <laughs> but he also has to be a little bit handsome, which is like, but he doesn't quite know it and she knows it, you know? And I think like, you know, there's a, um, there's, there's a word for this that we can't, that we can't say on, on podcast deluxe. Wow. Uh, but I think that, yeah, I think she was um, hypnotized, let's say, wow. uh, <laughs> by, by Leonardo DiCaprio's character. Um <laughs> <laughs> true true <laughs> and i'll leave it at that <laughs> um another frustration i have with this film this is again all the musician cameos <laughs> sorry to cut you off it's fine um <laughs> i didn't I, I i didn't immediately piece together that it was jason isbell although it makes a lot of sense that it was jason isbell yeah. um great I, great smarmy performance really like dead on also, we see Sturgill Simpson, mm -hmm. very wry performance mm -hmm. from Sturgill Simpson. We'll we get see, to the Jack White bit in a moment. We will. Uh, Pete Yorn. Uh, Pete Yorn, yes, whose brother is the manager to both Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese. There's an old um, Wall Street Journal story about the three Yorn brothers, how they have all this uh, all this power. Uh, Pete, actually the least important Yorn. It's true. I mean, I, I'm they're not, like I'm, agents and managers. I I'm think, literally not. I would never argue that Pete would. Be uh, though he's other. aged really well. Great face for he the looks screen. Great. Um, um. <laughs> genuinely looked great. I thought. Um, okay. Here's the thing. Again, I want to reemphasize. This is a long, long, long. I made it through a whole thing of popcorn. And Did you buy the Taylor Swift bucket? No, they didn't have it out there. <laughs> the, the whole thing of popcorn, a whole thing of Reese's Pieces. Like, I, it was a long, long movie. Why? I hit a Celsius at like the two hour mark. I brought it you in. You brought my it in. That's, yep. I, you might need to do that. Yep. So, why are there at least three expository devices that are communicating plot points that were not communicating in the film? One, or plot points or depth of info, like information sure. that should be communicated by character exposition. I think. Yeah, first at the beginning of the film, uh, King gives Ernest a book about the history of the Osage people and the land and the nation, which you don't get too deep into. No, but it's sort of like someone could have said that, like the guy who's driving Ernest up when Ernest yep. says, "Whose land is this?" and the guy says, yep. uh, "Is an is an Osage character," and says pointedly, "It's my land." That doesn't have to be a one and one. That could be. Let me get to the end of this before you start naysaying. Let me yeah, get to fine. the end of it. So there's that, and almost kind of sets it up that the that the Osage are like a Fantasia people, mm -hmm. and maybe that's what they're trying to communicate that to these folks, to these white men, they are. But to to think that you, they have to be studied in the book or that the book is the way to learn about them rather than interacting, that's one thing. Two. There's at least two, I think, two segments in the film where they use, like, newsreel-style footage. Uh, and part of that, they're using newsreel-style footage to make an implicit link between what happened to the an Osage explicit people. Link, explicit link, Between what happened to the Osage and what happened in Tulsa with the massacre, the Black Wall Street massacre. Um, I Look, I don't know how news traveled in that era. I don't know that news of the Tulsa massacres was making it to the Osage people. I, I just don't know. It seemed 
uh, heavy handed. It was a little heavy handed, and, and it, in they hit they hit on that a couple times. You hear someone say Tulsa, you see the footage, you hear someone else say Tulsa, and like I don't know, like I have not read the David Graham book, like I don't know if Graham has documented cases where people in the Osage community were like, we have heard that this happened elsewhere with the black residents of Tulsa. Like I I don't know uh, if that's what if that's real. All good. But if it's sort of a concession to like modern understandings of how these circumstances are, that felt a little bit off. And then finally, and I, I, I this did come up in a conversation I had about the film last night with the person, they know who they are. Uh, that was some Wes Anderson type. The radio play at the end. Unbearable. Really unbearable. Doesn't make the film feel more historic. If anything, it makes it feel like it's play like you you've, 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 you've come a, you've come a really playful. long way that you're like this is a Wes Anderson thing because we talked about Asteroid this, City which has all yes. these framing devices this uh, Russian nesting doll of framing devices um, uh, I'm proud I'm proud of you this is like I feel emotional uh, uh, just at but the, like Scorsese at the... is better than that and what is the utility of doing that what, what doesn't make me feel more emotionally attached to the story you've just spent three hours sort of taking my emotional affections, killing off characters I care about, and then at the end, I've just got a bunch of, like, white folks in suits on a stage going, like, so... Wah, 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 wah. He takes a sip of liquor. Wah, wah. Like, I, I just... I, this is not... Uh, to me, this felt like a cop-out. I don't know how I feel about the ending. I need to sit with it for more than 24 hours, especially given how long the film was. Uh, it has not been that long since I finished watching this movie. Yeah. Um, I will say, as far as an ending of self-recrimination, I thought it was meant to... and. If you got this far on the podcast, either you're not going to see this movie or yeah. you've already seen it. Uh, so you know that Scorsese appears himself yes. to read the obituary of Molly Burkhart. Um, I think with a big lucky strike sign in the background uh, and there's product placement in the thing. I think he's very much holding himself to account and saying as much as I am keeping this story alive and bearing witness and telling it for the benefit of history, I am also profiting off of it uh, for Apple, which has, you know, uh, factories in blah, blah, blah. Read uh, New York Times if you want to know sure. about, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to get, get into that yeah. stuff. Um, but I think like I think he he felt such a. I felt he felt conflicted about being the one to tell the story. And I think that goes back to the turning around of it to not tell it through the FBI character. I think that goes to, you know, his outreach to to native people the people yeah. and, and making sure that they signed off on it. Um, there's the clip going around of of one of the one of the Osage people um, on the red carpet talking about his relationship okay. to the film, mm -hmm. which is quite profound. As, as an Osage, I really wanted this to be from the perspective of Molly, but I think it would take an Osage to do that. This history is being told almost pr from the perspective of um, Ernest Burkhart, and they kind of give him this conscience, and they kind of depict that there's love. I think in the end, the question that you can be left with is how long will you be complacent with racism? And and it brings me to my overall question, which is like, and I I'm defending it to you in the in the context of this conversation but i like i said at the beginning i don't know that i loved this movie um and i my expectations could not have been higher mm -hmm. um because this is probably my favorite filmmaker and yeah. like and this seemed like rich storytelling material for him but i wonder if he hasn't internalized the last decade or more of criticism of the way that he tells stories. Tell me more about that because I don't know a lot about that. So particularly Wolf of Wall Street is a good example because so he I has have seen. okay so he I, has I, this I'm quite liked he has this renaissance with The Departed yeah. uh, in the aughts yeah. and then all of a sudden he gets to make big movies again. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't necessarily look like it was going to go in that direction with his yeah, relationship this is in with Zach the studios. Story. He talks a lot yes. about what happened after the seventies and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, and Wolf of Wall Street is a party and it's on 11 for three hours, yeah. a very quick three hours. Um, and it, and it's you're, a, it's a mood. 
It's a movie. It's a movie. It's a movie. As and you're say. only through the eyes uh, of the Jordan Belfort character mm-hmm. and you're the debauchery. You're you're complicit in the debauchery. And the criticisms of that film, and I think you hear this from people who work on Wall Street today, is mm-hmm. that there's a whole generation of finance bro who's like, I watched Wolf of Wall Street and I was like, that looks sick. In the same way that there's a whole generation of gangster mm-hmm. who looks at Scarface, not a Scorsese movie, but mm-hmm. Goodfellas mm-hmm. also, and mm-hmm. says like, that looks sick. Yeah. And I think that if you're watching the movies in that way, you're you're a bad fan and you're misinterpreting because he's obviously showing the moral rot at the center of society and he's making you complicit in enjoying it on purpose. Yeah, root for the bad guy. But in this, he was like, fine, you think I'm too subtle? Like, I'm going to spell out for you who the bad guys are from the very beginning of the movie. They're going to say, this is the bad thing we're going to do. Then you're going to watch them do the bad thing. You're going to feel for the people who are suffering and I'm going to drive it home at every turn and I'm going to hold my gaze on how bad this is and I'm never going to blink. And I don't know if this is him. It's to me, if he's internalizing this criticism of his films and that's why he made this movie differently, then that's sad because his movies were good and they, the, the, they got, I got the message anyway. And most, most people, I think intelligent people who watch his films did, but on the flip side, if he's just 80 years old and he's feeling more earnest, shout out to the title character of this or, movie, yeah. and he's like, it is now my duty, like I've had my fun, it is now my duty to make something morally righteous uh, and, and I'll do it, then I can accept it more than if he felt like his past movies were not getting that uh, message across. I guess, I guess maybe something that maybe could go hand in hand with your second option is truthfully a lot of the evil in this film is extremely mundane yes. and banal yes all the killing it's not um this is not gangster film killing this is you're seeing it from far away it's not gory kind of in the except for the scene with one of molly's sisters being um uh having an autopsy of sorts performed on her um, but the when they're shooting, it's not cool. Like the no, like no casino cool. is cool, or like Goodfellas is cool. No, it, the, any murder that happens, it's it's in wide shot. Uh, you're not really seeing anything gruesome except for the act itself. Um, the way that Scorsese relates to evil, like you say in in prior films, is evil is sexy. And to me, I don't know that this. Maybe it's a response to this criticism. I don't know, but maybe it's an acceptance that evil is everywhere evil is but not like literally anyone is capable of evil the number of people who fall on one moral side uh, who could tilt either way morally in this film it's just jason isbell (laughs) he's the only pure evil person (laughs) no i'm saying no no i'm saying he's the only one who's like a little bit good and a little bit evil. no but even the people who are like assigned the like the contract killer like it's like is that like a cold-blooded killer or is it just a guy who like needed an extra hundred dollars or five hundred dollars or a car yeah or a car and so what ends up happening is these characters they're not that like apart from king De Niro, yeah. And Jason is both characters. Uh, <laughs> like, no one is a pure villain. And I think part of what Scorsese is, is essentially saying is, if he's responding to criticism, maybe this is that. But I think he's essentially saying that this could happen anywhere. And that's where the kind of ties to the Tulsa thing yeah. feel a little bit more legit. Yeah. Like, it happened here. Sure. It could happen there. It's happening in 2021 or 2023. It's happening right now. Uh, and pointing back at you and saying it could be you you could be on the wrong side of this if that's the message okay i can get with that like i can live with that sure that feels it's real. the the revisionism in the way in it's the first i think it's notable it's the first time he's made a, a true western a western yeah and he's like no way am i going to make the westerns that i grew up on mm-hmm. like it's only going to be a complete topsy-turvy version of that um and I will say the part where it really worked in in that revisionism is like the visual language of the Osage is like incredible. Uh, Malena, like, our colleague Malena, wrote a, a piece that had to do with costume. A thing that in the piece that I did not know is that at the trading post on Osage land, there was a Tiffany's counter. I mean, they the are 20s. dripped out. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> like, unbelievable. Y'all think y'all drip. Like, you think you're dripping. The fits are the blankets, like the, the blankets I mean, crazy. The jewels, 
the hair. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, like the cars. Yeah, and I think you know, Scorsese has said that one of his favorite young filmmakers is Ari Aster. I know your relationship to uh, horror, so you haven't seen have Midsummer. No, um, but there is a lot of Midsummer in this film uh, in terms of the sort of the traditional um, festival sort of vibrant color and the way the generations interact with each other outside of typical western american sure. society um and, and all, that like i could have i could have i could have lived I, in that i do want to i do want to say that like for all the sort of quibbles about pacing in the first half and these kind of expository devices the way that he fills the screen and truly fills the screen all corners front back that is a beautiful thing to watch. And actually, I will say this. I do wish I'd watched it in a better theater. A bigger screen. A yeah. bigger screen yeah. with better sound. Because yeah. there were moments where I've, I'm watching it as if, and I'm in a theater that, I mean, if you live near me, you know the theater I was watching it. <laughs> that theater's been it's around. Dinky. <laughs> yeah, it's been around for certainly since I was a teenager, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, or in my 20s, at least. Um and I don't think the sound systems improve. And there were moments where yeah. things were happening, and I was like, damn, this, I really was meant to hear this and hear the sound here and here and there and see it huge and have the color be super rich. That I know, even from the diminished viewing experience that I had, I know that that's excellent. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Go to the movies, says John Caramonica. I regret <laughs> to inform you. I am a cineast now. <laughs> uh, you want to listen to some music? I do. I'm a little bit ambivalent about my song choice, but I feel like knowing I what have your song choice is, yeah, I also am ambivalent. But I feel like I choice. have to center it because I'm still processing it, much to in the way I'm still processing you center, Flower Moon. You have to center it. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yes. Strong language. Uh, Lyrical Lemonade. Yes. The YouTube channel. Yes. Of the music video director Cole Bennett. Cole Bennett, who's now putting out music in a, D- like a, in a DJ Khaled way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which has been happening for a while. Yeah. Uh, their latest track, his latest track, uh, is by a little singer called Corbin, featuring really taking me back. Lil Tracy also and Black taking me Cray. Back. Also taking me back. This is a golden moment for. This is what the 2016, 17. So Corbin. Better known I, as Spooky, Spooky Black. Black. When did I review Spooky Black at SOB? An ill-advised yeah. when, artist when, name, which he's since changed. When did I, when was that? 2014. 14? So, I don't know if you'll remember this. Spooky Black on my memo for this job. Really? Yes. Oh, yeah. I was like, I, wouldn't have, I, I, was like, I should go to Minnesota and write about this little scene. I would not have remembered that if you had not tried, but now I completely remember because I remember the conversation yes. that we, wow. An really, incredible, really behind the scenes an here. incredible YouTube video called Without You that he put out. Um, it's, I mean, just go watch it. We're not, we can't even play it here. It's just like, he's wearing a do-rag, he's white. It's a strange thing. Uh, and then he sort of disappeared. He didn't take fame like that was offered to him changed his name to Corbin. He co-wrote one of the best future songs ever, Crazy But True, uh, which is crazy but true. Um, And now here he is on Hello There by Lyrical Lemonade singing a Blink-182 song. It's really bizarre. (laughs) Uh, I Miss You, uh, the Blink-182 song, which I'm not a Blink guy. I never have been. Um, But up there with Josie and Damn It is I Miss You. I think it's like probably their third mm-hmm. best song of all time. I only like early Blink and late Blink, I guess. Um, and this is a SoundCloud rap all-star posse reunion. This is, and, and just as a total non sequitur sidebar. So at this SOB show, and I think we can post that we'll have this photo. Uh, so Spooky Black had a song called DJ Khaled is my father. Yes. And DJ Khaled appeared at oh, this wow. show. Very, very insane time. Wild era. I'm sure DJ Khaled has no memory of this, but <laughs> no. it, I just, that was like early internet where it could be like, is this sort of meme Is this a thing? And then Cal, like, it it didn't get translated well on the way to Khaled, and Khaled, like, took it super seriously, and then I think showed up and was like, what is this freak show? Like, 
what are what is going on here? The whole thing is nuts. Anyway. Let's listen to a little bit of Hello There by Corbin, Lil Tracy, and Black Cray. Wow. Everything says that, yeah, your heart was keeping tally. What once was everlasting, never more. You know where to find me, where I'll ask you for forgiveness. Every night I kiss your memory to bed. Wish you never left. Something a lot more solid. Yeah, no, no, but nothing as complicated as that. No. Um, so uh, Mustafa, Mustafa is a Muslim folk singer from Toronto. I wrote about in 2021, I believe. His album from that year, it's called When Smoke Rises, was I think it was my album of the year. It's, I think it's 21. This is a person who channels grief incredibly delicately um sort of that very very tender overlap between grief and hope um i i found his first album like almost like destabilizing it's a tough listen very very intense um name of god is his new song it's first song he's put out i think since the album maybe there's one Maybe he did like a collaboration or something. Maybe, I think he's like on the Metro Boomin album or something. A misuse of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, shouts out to Metro, but like, I'm not sure if that's right. Um, and this song has a bit of pulse in the production, uh, not from drums, uh, but it has a little bit of pulse in the production. Uh, it is partially produced by, I regret to say, Aaron Dessner. Wow. Uh but uh, uh, maybe about as jamming as a Desner song could get. And a Mustafa song. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's uh, it's it's beautiful. It's heart rending, uh, and it's worth sitting with. Uh, so this is Name of God. We got to sweeten the room. Yeah. All right. A lot of tragedy on this episode. Real talk. Uh, so if you are like me, frustrated with the American experiment, uh, the American experiment that gave us the murder of the Osage people, that gave us the tragedy of Britney Spears, um, you will not be surprised to know that all the good Oreos come from elsewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the amount of American Oreo alt flavors versus the hit rate is deeply depressing. They are so chemically most of the time. Okay, so we've got two flavors. You start with this one. I bought these in the East Village, uh, you know, at an exotics shop. While you were going on a weed trip. (laughs) Uh, These appear to be mango-flavored Oreos. And these are... uh, Sawyer did a Google Translate on this. What did this one come up as? Sour. I'm something? not really sure. Uh, it looks like it looks like flower flavor. Yeah, they look like flower. It's flavors. a flower flavor. Yeah. Um, if you can translate for us, we'll throw a photo of these up on the screen. Let us know what we're eating. They are beautiful. They're packaged beautifully. This is another thing Americans are really lacking on in the Oreo market: packaging. Yeah, you like these little half sleeves? Oh my god. You like that? I, I actually can't tell if this is how they're supposed to smell Ooh. or if they're just rancid. No, no. I think these smell sour, but like in an intentional way. They smell like... Fruit flavor like Oreo. Tea. I mean, they smell like crazy. fragrant tea. Well, it makes sense if it's flower flavored. Huh. Hmm. Hmm. It got wooden real fast. I wouldn't think that I ever wanted a fruit flavored cookie. I'm not like a fig newton guy this is novel certainly novel but a little bit like eating perfume i'm one bites enough of this for me i'll try the pink one though oh wow oh this smell is something it really didn't nail the smell 
Shout out to the food scientists. Of really. mango? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Right? So Bizarre. A little bit like a foot. Is it durian that's, flavored? That's for the OnlyFans. <laughs> Is this durian flavored Oreo? True, great question. Mm. 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 These are not for me. Ooh. Oh, man. It's like the perfume counter, but all the perfumes at once. And a candle. The flavor of this cream, I think, is pretty okay. I think overall, this is better than that. Yeah, but... Oh, there's like a little banana aftertaste to the pink one? I didn't catch that one. Oof. These are, these um, are not for me. I'm going to go... This, to me, is a, a five and a half on the mango... And like a three on that. These are ones for me. These are one ads. I I I can't fi- I can't finish a cookie. Hats off to the effort yeah. on taking a swing this big. This is a huge <laughs> swing for a snack flavor. But I hope to never think about these again. Oof. Oof. Um, I am fascinated by the. You're gonna eat another mango one, aren't you? The simulacrum here, like, is really good. This is like. Mm. Okay. Oof. All right, a lot of tragedy on this episode. I regret to end it this way. That is our show. Listen to every episode of Popcast at nytimes.com slash popcast. Watch every episode of Popcast Deluxe at tinyurl.com slash popcast deluxe. Most of them are not as preoccupied with the failures of, of this country, uh, although some are. In between the lines. Yeah. <laughs> it's less explicit, your usually. Um Subscribe to Popcast anywhere you get your audio or audio slash video content. That is Spotify, Apple, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. We have a very active Discord, a popping Facebook group, tinyurl.com slash Popcast Facebook or slash Popcast Discord. Um, email us, popcastnytimes.com. Sometimes we take questions. We got a mailbag episode coming up. Get involved. We'd love Shout to- out to Justin Charity for hopping in the Discord to argue about Drake. Did he do that? Oh, yeah. A legend. A legend. Now, and now a Midwestern legend. So shout out to him. Um, our senior producer, Sawyer Roquet. Our editor is Jamie Heffitz. Uh, thank you, as always, to Karen Gans, Pedro Rosado, Nell Galogli, Pat Gunther. Even Leslie Davis. Leslie Davis, Nina Lossom. Yeah. Um, Whole team. Everybody, we appreciate you. We'll be back next week.